NU6F, Reno, um, Ron De Silva, got my ham ticket back in high school in electronics, and like I was telling John, we had our high school electronics teacher that told us if we got our ham license, he would give us all the parts to build our own radio, so that's how it started back in 65. And so since then, like most of us, the hobby, you get hot and cold on it, but here recently, uh, it's been going back to the old stuff that we used to modify as kids, all the old World War II surplus stuff. One of the things that uh, I was really trying to get into was some Navy World War II receivers. The RAL was one receiver I'd heard a lot about by the collectors, and since I do a lot of CW, so I was ready to go ahead and buy one another friend had restored. I'm looking for parts. I see there's a pawn shop in Carson City that has one. It looks like it was sitting in the ocean off the dock for 15 years. There were literally holes eaten through the front panel. Anything that was brass or copper had green corrosion on it. But I figured for parts, knobs, whatnot, $45, my brother and I bring it back. For the heck of it, I hook it up to a B plus and filament. It's still working. I ended up doing the full restoration on that. And once I spent so much time in resurrecting this, I had all the receivers I needed for a shipboard Navy World War II setup, but I didn't have a transmitter. So that motivated me to look for the smallest shipboard transmitter I could find, the TDE. So checking with uh, some of our fellow collectors, we found there was one and uh, this one in particular, like John will mention later, was uh, had its film debut, but um, it was um, converted sometime in the 19, late 40s, early 50s. You'll see there's an extra function switch, Master Oscillator HF FSK. It was, uh, after the war, it was converted to a radio teletype service, and the power supply in the base of these, it was pretty standard uh, configuration for all the ships, any place it was going to be used, even submarines would use it. It was a motor generator that supplied both the 500 and the 2000 volts. Um, this particular one originally was a three phase 220 volt, so that was going to be the first issue was making three phase 220. Um, then finding the motor generator set that hadn't run in maybe 50 years. Um, so we went ahead and loaded it all up, brought it here to Reno, out in the garage, did a complete tear down. The motor generator set was the first. Um, anyhow, it was a long story finding the best way to do three phase, quiet three phase, no solid state uh, variable frequency drives. But uh, anyhow, we got that done and uh, I'll show you what the typical startup sequence is. Normally the motor generator that's out in the laundry room sits inside here. Way too noisy in the shack. You can't... I you, bet. Earphones only is the only way. You can kind of picture what it must have been like. You know, uh, I've got one photo somewhere of a submarine, a, a sub uh, radio operator. Obviously everybody's got earphones on and the TDE with the motor generator running. But anyhow, I'll show you the sequence. Uh, I've got a little more high-tech now for uh, remoting. This is the motor generator set. The um, one horsepower motor, three phase 220 driving at 500 volt. It's a dual winding armature, which is really something nobody makes anymore. Um, long story on rebuilds for this. But anyhow, this was all torn down, took all the windings out, cleaned, baked them all in the oven, measured them, re-insulated, 
new bearings and brushes, the rest. And the first one ran for a month before the generator burned out. This is generator number two, which uh, had no issues. And I think it's, it's gonna be good for another several years. Okay. So the startup is for the three phase out in the garage, we've got the 220 single phase coming in. This is the static converter, this is the rotary converter. And I've got it all in remote control. So oh, wow. you start Check here. That out. And so from in the house, I can go ahead and turn on the three phase. The pony motor here is a three horsepower 1800 RPM motor. Okay. And that's really acting as the generator to go ahead and stabilize it. So instead of a bunch of capacitors, it's really a nice clean three phase AC. Okay, okay, cool. And so far the generator's not running. We have a power, but I'll hit the start button inside. Okay, I'll let you get in front of me and the lighting's gonna change a little bit here, guys. So just bear with the camera. <laughs> okay, no one's spin around. Seemed like all these vintage uh, radios that had, uh, neighbor radios that had MG sets, you had start and stop buttons. Like in a regular motor starter device inside. Start it up. Cool. Your B plus comes up to 700 to 1,000 volts on a residual magnetism. Um, as soon as you key down, you'll end up with uh, the voltage will kick up to the 2 kV. Um, you can tell by the MG set out there. You, you don't want that in the shack. Yeah, but it's not bothersome at all in here. No, no, here it's not bad. I mean, it sounds like maybe somebody's vacuuming the floor in the yeah, living room. Yeah, so when you got the volume up, I'm listening to the guys on the net, whatever else. You're, right now we're on 40 CW. And, uh, and I'll give you guys a little closer in shot of the transmitter. Shot of these these guys here because nobody got to see those close up. Yeah, what a nice job you did. The RAL, um, you've got um, it's knob intensive. Uh, it's a two section TRF, so you have two sections of tuned radio frequency RF amps. You've got your regen control. Bring it into regeneration for CW. When I'm on AM, I leave it down here. Outer regeneration. Um, your fine vernier tune here, this is your gross tune, everything is just by logging dials, there's no, uh, no direct frequency readout on either receiver or transmitter. Um, the band switches are here, and uh, you're good up to 23 megs. Nice. Um, and uh, if you want really sharp, the only selectivity the radio has is if you just fine tune that regen to just on the edge of regen, there you're maybe 50 kc wide, which is about as sharp as it's going to get. You can cut in, you can cut in some of the step tunable audio, audio filters up here. You can, ah, okay, you can hear that, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. You can hear. And so if there's a signal in there, they really jump out. It's really quite noticeable. The RF selectivity isn't there, but your ear will just lock into the note of right. the station you're on. The right. rest of the guys really on top of them. They're very sharp filters. Okay, cool. So tell, tell me a little bit more. We've got to do the pounds for wattage. Oh yeah. I think you win the award on this I one. I think this is probably This close. is, you know, the, the award for the bad boy. Because, okay, now let me show you guys this. Okay, you're looking at this big transmitter. How much is it weigh? Uh, when the MG set is in here, like it normally is, yeah. 690 pounds. Okay, 690 pounds. Now, and I know this answer, but that's yeah. why I'm building it up. What's the uh, AM carrier, what's power output on this transmitter? Okay. In CW, it doesn't sound that bad, 130 watts. Okay. On AM, you're 25 to 30 watts AM. 25 to 30 watts AM for this big, <laughs> big beast. But we don't judge. Just because a transmitter puts out a kilowatt doesn't necessarily make it a bad boy transmitter. 
this is a bad boy transmitter because of the historical sense yeah. of it, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, this thing is. These 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 were used in the war, man. I mean, this is yeah. history you're looking at. Yeah. And there's mean, not. I don't know of any other ones. There's uh, probably in a museum or yeah, two. Yeah, the museum ships I've kept in touch. I just sent a letter off to uh, email to um, 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 the North uh, North uh, North Carolina, and uh, they I saw an article like 11 years ago. They were restoring the TDE there, and they okay. had the same sim same symptoms of the MG set. They sent it to a motor shop to rebuild. Came back, still didn't work. I haven't heard back from them. The other one is the Massachusetts that's there on, on Battleship Row. Um, where is it? It's not, it's not New Bedford. Where the heck is it? I'll think of where it is. But anyhow, okay. so there's one there. There's one other. I think there's there's three that I know of that, and that's it, that are still running on an MG set. Most converted them obviously to an a to a regular AC supply. What's the uh, final output tube in that thing? Uh, 803s, in fact the tubes, the 803s, is kind of cool. I got these from my high school electronics teacher in 65. Okay. <laughs> I don't I carried these things around forever. What are we ever going to use them for? Little did I know that you, you were going to need them. I was going to need them. So I have my my okay. spare T803s yeah, okay. in there. Cool. Very cool. And so as you guys will see in the video, this transmitter was in the movie Wind Talkers with uh, one of uh, our ham radio buddies, yeah. TKX yeah. Andy, who I will try and point out in the video that you guys saw at the beginning. We'll run the full clip at the end of this so you can see yeah. the full clip. Uh, but uh, yeah, TDE, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know, I, I'm learning with dealing with all you military collector guys because I was never into the military stuff but I never heard of this thing until you brought it up you know and this is cool history it really is cool history and I'm glad you uh, you know you and Andy you know rescued the thing yeah where where was it do you know where did, where it served at we don't know I don't, I don't think Andy found never found anything on it um, he located it, he and Tom O.P. located it in a guy's garage. I want to say it was between Watsonville and Prunedale, I think of where it was. Okay. But it was down that way. Some guy, they heard about it. it Did was it in the garage. full restoration at that point? Yeah, too? it had yeah. some mouse damage in it and whatnot. It was in a covered area. Um, it was missing the, uh, the uh, this switch, the adjust to and operate switch. And uh, it's a all the switches, uh, if we, we could rack it out, but you swing this out, and I've got steel cables so it doesn't fall down. Gotcha. Um, so they're massive switches, uh, big stacks, ceramic decks with silver plated wide contacts that are overkill. But well, that was military. missing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was missing. So all Andy could do, apparently, was he took the, the, there's two transmitters in the rack. This is the intermediate frequency, which covers 500 kC to 1500 kC. And then the mirror image transmitter on this side is the HF side from 1500 up to 20 megs. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, two complete, uh, the only thing common this year is the power supply and uh, the metering. And that's, uh, that's about it, other than that, they each have a separate RF ammeter for the, uh, the low frequency side and the HF side. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, when I picked it up, it had uh, an old uh, Tom OPE had an MG set that he wanted to pull from his and convert it to AC. So that's the MG set that originally re restored, built into here. Um, the only thing uh, then was to come up with the switch. Um, anyhow, I ended up building a new switch. Cool. With pieces and parts. And it was a five, this was originally a five position switch with one deck. I added the second deck to it. And uh, then the other issue was to come up with this, the detents for three positions. So okay. I machined a new detent plate. It's mounted behind this. Of course, it's all rebuildable. It's all with set screws and um, hardware, there's nothing riveted 
glue solder. That's how they made them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's totally rebuildable. You could have like a, today's. Stuff. Yeah. You could have a shipboard kit of contacts, of springs, detents, everything, and you could rebuild pretty much anything. But nowadays it's tough. So now we've got the the uh, the low frequency side is back intact, and the other um, uh, the original. The original logging dial here still has some of the original frequencies that were on it, and obviously there's no um, there's no direct frequency readout, so you'd have to use the uh, you'd spot it the LM221. The 221. Yeah. Yep. You'd have to use the LM221 to go ahead and do your spotting, correct your frequency on with that logging dial. So you have logging dials on the RAL and on the TV. So you kind of know pretty much once you do it. Yeah, you've got the. Yeah, you know. Okay. You kinda, you kinda know Forty where you're CW at. is going to be down here. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Very rest. cool. Um, if you want, we can try it over on AM. Put it on the dummy load. Put it on AM here for a minute. Yeah. Oh, let me change frequency. I just realized I'm still not on. I'm still on forty. So put it back. We're on dummy load. So so little power. Suppressor grid. Okay. Yeah. So okay. what you do is the radio is essentially when you go to AM position, the suppressor grid normally sits at the uh, uh, the cathode potential just to keep from secondary emissions from electrons off the plate. But if you bias that suppressor, you can shut the tube off. So essentially that's what it is. You've got the, the transmitter set up in AM position, the suppressor grid you take it off the cathode, the normal position for for just creating carrier, and they'll go ahead and you bias it to go ahead and run the power way down. So that's why it's only 20 watts carrier, but on voice peaks it'll be back up closer to 80 to 90 watts. Right, right, right. But that's the way they and did they it. It's made, backwards. Did they mainly they mainly use these on CW most of the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 CF, yeah, there wouldn't be much use for the end. Right. But yeah, so it was like, and then I love this, they always would justify it, the manuals would justify it. To save weight, we're using suppressor grid modulations <laughs> instead of a, a full a full plate modulated yeah. uh, speech amplifier. Right. So it's just got nothing more than a low level speech amplifier, one tube, that uh, that just varies the bias on the, uh, on the suppressor grid. Very cool. And that is how we ended up with another 700 pounds of boat anchors because of a $40 receiver from a, from a pawn shop in Carson City. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it is a bad boy transmitter. <laughs>
Yeah. 